Yo, what is up? You have found I Like the Blazers. I am your host, Brandon Goldner. And today, yes, we are talking about the Blazers. We have basketball to talk about. Let's do it. A really quick plug, though. I will say you've heard this on this feed. It's my new politics podcast I've been doing with my brother. It's called Remember Poli Sci. If you want to check it out at Remember Poli Sci, that's Remember P O L I S C I dot com, or on any podcatcher. It's on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. It's my brother and I talking about politics, and we bring it once a week. It's on its own feed now. Not going to bother you with it here. So yes, we have off-season stuff. We have trades. We have acquisitions. It's Blazers time. It's NBA time. After 2020, after everything that's happened, I'm so happy to be talking basketball with my good friend, the handsome, the ever effervescent Ryan Whitledge. Ryan, what's up, dude? Well, for one, I wasn't prepared for you to go Neil Olshay and bust out effervescent, so I don't have my word of the day calendar handy. I'm, now I'm all flummoxed there, but uh, uh, I'm effervescent I'm doing is all right. like it's when you drop the Alka Seltzer into the water and it starts bubbling. It's like bubbly. It's kind of like when you crack open a can of soda and it's like. Pfft. See, my idiot mind just thought you said Evanescence, and I'm now I got that song or I got one of their songs stuck in my head. So that, now I mean, I'm thinking about I'm now I'm thinking about the homie Evan M. Who, by the way, you should check out EvanM.com. He's got art for sale. He's got a Black Friday sale going on. Um, and, I already got a couple of his prints on the way. Nice, dude. Evan McCarthy's man. And by the way, speaking of Olshay, I will say quick sad podcasting news: the Rip City report with Casey Holdall and Joe Freeman is no more. Uh... We learned that the Oregonian put the kibosh on it, which I'm frustrated about. And uh, my last question to them, which they did not end up using, I don't blame them, was something along the lines of, is Neil Olshay as slimy in real life as he appears to us on camera? And I If did, you want a true answer to that question, I will tell you, take uh, Casey or Joel out for a beer. And uh, I, I've done that a couple times and we've chatted. I've chatted with them off the record. Uh, there's some fun stuff you learn chatting with people off the record. Oh, yeah. No, for sure. And like, I don't begrudge somebody for being a professional at their job. And he's, you know, Olshay is a former actor. And so he performs as is part of the job. And, you know, I, I get it. So I'm not trying to poop on him too much. Um, we will talk more about Olshay in the context of his job performance this offseason. Uh, but the Blazers made some moves. And Ryan, what I wanted to do was I want to talk a little bit about the Blazers lineup as they finished last season. Then I wanted to talk about the moves that they made who they added, who they lost, um, and kind of give then an off-season grade after we talk about those folks and kind of how we thought Olshay did. And at the end, we'll talk about how we think those minutes are going to be distributed. So uh, with your permission, I'm going to start. This is the, the Blazers lineup that they rolled out at the end of last year uh, during that playoff run with the Lakers. Uh, in the starting lineup, they were rolling with, with Dame. Well, actually, Dame was um, not starting he was he was out that yeah. last game but whatever he started the series i mean yeah. yeah once they threw in the towel he was out but he started yeah. the series so we'll we'll keep him in there we'll keep him for in there. conversation's I, sake and i just pulled up on basketball reference of the last game of that series so that threw me off a little bit but it was dame cj carmelo nurkic uh and uh hassan whiteside were they starting both those guys at the same time that doesn't seem right yeah because uh collins had uh screwed up his ankle by then Oh yeah, that's right. That's a good point. Let me. I'm just gonna go back to game three of that series. Just pull uh, up yeah. game one. That's your most game one's your most accurate. Okay, so I'm leaving this all in because I'm terrible and lazy. So you had Dame, oh. CJ, Carmelo, Whiteside, and Nurkic, and then off the bench you had Gary Trent Jr., Anthony Simons, Mario Hazonia, Wenyan Gabriel. Jalen Horde and Jalen Adams even playing some spot minutes there, although that was that was garbage time at that point. Um, and so then, like you said, injured, you had Zach Collins was injured. Rodney Hood was injured. Am I missing anyone else who was on that uh, on the lineup at the end of last year who just was injured, and not playing? I think that's it. Um, uh, no, not injured and not playing, but, uh, Jalen, did you mention Jalen Horde? I did. Yep. Okay. Uh, I mean, every fan favorite, Winian Gabriel, uh, had made a couple oh, appearances. Trevor Ariza didn't go to the bubble. So that's something else we should mention. Yes. Uh, his wife decided to be an absolute or ex-wife, sorry, decided to be an absolute bitch and, and decide to stick it to him by throwing a custody battle in his face when his team was going to the playoffs. So we are going to sidestep that topic altogether and just say that that was what the Blazers were rolling with at the end of last season, right? Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Let's just lay out who they added 
and then we'll tick through one by one. Um, so the Blazers, they did trade Trevor Ariza, and then they traded two first-round picks. Uh, one of them was for this year. One of them was next year. For Robert Covington, that was huge. They then used their mid-level exception to sign Derek Jones Jr. Um, they re-signed Rodney Hood to a two-year deal. I believe the second year is a team option. Um, they mm-hmm. drafted C.J. Ellaby in the second round, and now he's signed with the Blazers. Uh, they also traded for Ennis Cantor. So they traded Mario Hazonia and took back Ennis Cantor. He slid into a trade exception that the Blazers had. Uh, and then I'm missing one more. The Blazers also signed Harry Giles, um, who had been playing with the Kings. And some late breaking news, Hassan Whiteside just signed a one-year deal with the Kings. So he's officially gone, gone. Or a vet minimum. And what, I mean... Imagine just your star falling that much from he was like one of the big gets of that free agency several years ago. The Blazers were in the running to get him when he re-signed with Miami. So going from making 20 plus million to the vet minimum. And look, I mean, that's what he deserves at this point, frankly. But he's gone. Hassan Whiteside's gone. So again, the Blazers. Thank God. Thank goodness. So the Blazers essentially uh, losing, as far as like big pieces who were playing minutes for them, losing Trevor Ariza. Uh, losing Hassan Whiteside, uh, picking up Robert Covington, Derek Jones Jr., uh, maybe Harry Giles, we call it a big piece, then C.J. Ellaby in the second round, and then retaining Rodney Hood. Oh, and retaining Carmelo Anthony. We could not forget that. The Blazers mm-hmm. were able to sign Carmelo Anthony to a minimum. Um, so I want to give a grade at the end of this, but let's just tick through one by one, or I don't know if you want to call an audible and just do an overall thing right now, but the Robert Covington thing is the most important signing of these. Like, I don't care what Olshay said during his press conference where he was saying that Carmelo Anthony was the most important signing that we made. No, he wasn't. It was Robert yes, Covington. Was. Mello was, you think? I believe Mello was. And uh, Dave Deckard on Blazer's Edge had a great piece that was outlining exactly why. Mello is not important in terms i mean he is important he does contribute he will be a great bench scorer for this team but the biggest um contribution that uh Mello signing again can make for this team is for the future we have now i mean it, it it's it's kind of like a legacy signing per se you know you can have the conversation about like oh well let's win one for mellow or whatnot you know because that'll be brought up if you know the blazers somehow end up winning a championship this year um when they win the championship they're this willing year. to win yeah i'm i'm that's your jinx not mine um <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, and then down the road, it, it's now shown other free agents or other other veterans and even Damian Lillard with, you know, his age um, that they care about, you know, the players as people just as much as they care about the players as, you know, what they can contribute. So yeah. it, so since you started with Mello, let's do talk about that signing. Um, he, he's signing for the vet minimum, so it's going to be you know a, a million in change. That I actually I, technically his contract, that vet minimum contract with his years of service, the Blazers are only on the hook for like one point six three million of it. The league picks up the remaining million. Interesting. Okay, that's helpful. That's a that's a rule that was put in uh, a couple years ago so that it wouldn't dissuade teams from signing aging veterans. And so after so many years of service, if you sign for a vet minimum, the team is only obligated to pay, you know, that certain percentage of it and the league as a whole picks up the remaining part. Look at you, capologist. Uh, no, that's I, actually you know I I read my Eric Griffin tweets. <laughs> yeah, no. He he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, that's uh, that's actually really helpful. I'm using the cap sheet from uh, the Dunked On podcast, Nate Duncan and Danny Larue, and they've been updating that throughout the off season. So that's and it mm-hmm. only shows one point six. So I appreciate that extra context. Yeah, that's that's the team's obligation of it. Mello is actually making about a million more. Okay. So, and look, he's made plenty of money in his career. But uh, to your point about how important this signing is, I don't think there's any doubt that Carmelo could have signed with any number of teams. He's a Hall of Famer. People love Carmelo Anthony. He is really, really well liked around the league. I mean, do you have any doubt that he easily could have gotten this much money or potentially even more money somewhere else and potentially? With a larger role, I'm going to roll my question a little bit longer to say that, you know, Olshay said during his press conference that he talked with Carmelo Anthony about 
you maybe are going to start, but you're probably coming off the bench. We're probably mm-hmm. going to play you about 20, 22 minutes a game, but you know, you're going to be ending a lot of games. And that Carmelo Anthony hearing that from Neil Olshay said, yes, this, I want to be in Portland again. This is where I want to sign. I mean, do you have any doubt that he could have gotten that money somewhere else? I mean, is it significant that he decided to come back to Portland? From that same press conference, Olshay, and it kind of depends on how much of a car salesman you think he is, how much he kind of talks up certain aspects of things. He stated that Mello did receive many offers from many other teams. I believe that. For a very similar role. I 100% believe that. And yes, Olshay is a car salesman, but I will take his word on that. Yeah, uh, uh, me as well. And so... Mello, he's gotten the rap. I mean, I was anti Mello from way before the Blazers ever signed him when he was first brought up of possibly going to the Blazers. Um, You're a Mello hater hipster then. You were hating Mello before it was cool. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And... But the media loves him. The locker room loves him. Everything you hear about him as a person and his personality since his, you know, humbling uh, via Houston has just been fantastic. So if I'm inclined to believe everything that I hear that Mello did want to reciprocate the love or his love towards the team that the team showed him. So if he if he did get offers, you know. The only way that I would kind of call bullshit on it is if you're going to tell me that, you know, LeBron James uh, offered him. And yes, I'm saying LeBron James and not Rob Palenka. Uh, If LeBron (laughs) James offered him a vet minimum contract to come to the Lakers and he turned it down. If you're going to try to float that story to me, I'm mm, I'm not going to buy that. Uh, But everything that we've heard and has been reported on, I'm I'm inclined to believe. And good good for the Blazers. It it shows that they care about the players as as people as That's much it. as they do as players. And I, even with the uh um the DJJ signing, which I'm only saying that because I've effed up his name about 19 different times so far. Um DJ Jazzy Jones. With, yeah. Junior. <laughs> but but with <laughs> but with that, by the way, the Blazers, how many junior we're up to two juniors. Uh we have a a, a the third on the team you have two CJs. Well, we're just legacy. But anyways, um, it, it's there's stuff in, in that with his signing that shows that the Blazers care about players as as individuals. But no, I believe Carmelo Anthony is important both because he still has offensive potential and scoring output that can contribute to a winning team, especially if he's willing to accept a bench role in limited minutes and having, uh, you know, some spot up times and in, in, uh, closing out games. Um yeah, it's well, it's it's a good deal. I want to go back to that point about like, it, well, first of all, he still has some gas left in the tank. Melo is playing like 40 plus minutes a game in that Lakers series. And some of those games were close, man. I mean, he was playing quality minutes against the eventual champions. So, yeah, he has something left to give. And to your point about it going all the way back to whether this is most important signing or not. I don't believe that, but I do think it says something. And I want to reiterate what you were saying about what this communicates to other players around the league about the Blazers caring about their players. So Mello was on his last legs last year, right? And the Blazers said, this will be your role. This is what Mm -hmm. we want you to do. We knew that Dame and CJ had been making overtures toward Mello for years, trying to get him to come to Portland. He agreed. He came. He was beloved. Everyone wanted him to be here. He knew what his role was and he played it. And that level of trust with a Hall of Fame player, with somebody who has credibility and a reputation around the league, that's a really, really good thing. And I I do want to give credit to Olshay. And I'm going to say this probably a couple times during this podcast. And if you know me, me. it pains me. It pains me, too. If you know me, you know that I'm not a Neil Olshay apologist. (laughs) Far from it. But Mm -hmm. I do think that that matters, and I really – I think that Melo coming back to the Blazers signals something important about where this franchise is, about where they are in Damian Lillard's life cycle as as an athlete – and their willingness to to pay to really push and go for it, and I I couldn't be happier. So I think the Melo signing was important. The most important I would quibble with, but it it was certainly important. Um, Do you have anything else you want to say about Melo before we move on? No, no, no. I, I, I think we've touched on everything for it. Um, as, as far as long as 
this doesn't end up turning into a malcontent, which even I, I think even if Mello behind the scenes is super pissed off with what his role ends up being on the team, if he's, you know, like third guy off the bench or, or whatever, it behooves him to maintain the image that he's now rebuilt. And I don't think keep that as super quiet as humanly possible. And I don't think and that's going to be an issue. Like I, I have every trust that Olshay and Mello were honest with each other before he signed and that they're on the same page. I do trust that. And, and it very much sounded like, like that was made clear and they, you know, that Mello signing was delayed. So I wouldn't doubt the fact that Mello was one of the very first calls that the organization made and they let him take his time to decide and let him field offers from other teams and, and, you know, weighed his options on our other teams just float me a line of bullshit or can i stay here and this organization after last season where they came into it with the you know the everyone recognizes that there was a handshake agreement for Melo to start and he was going to get a certain amount of playing time be able to get a certain amount of shots you know they kept their word so Melo has the promises from these other teams that he probably facilitated offers from and or entertained offers from and then he just decided, well, they didn't lie to me. They kept their word. And here's what they're telling me. So I know my defined role. The only issue I will have with the mellow signing is if at the tail end of the year, if we look back at a uh, you know a shot chart and we're seeing that he was averaging 16 to 20 shots a game, that's a little too much for him, even in a second unit. But that that would be my only complaint. Other than that, I'm fully on board with this mellow signing. Now I, we can re- loop back to your Roco thing. Well, yeah, and I... I don't see him taking too many shots as being a problem. The Blazers have depth that they've maybe never had before since they've had Damian Lillard, and and I think that's super important, and we are going to get to that too. Um, So now we will go to the signing that I think was the most important, uh, or the trade, rather, the the Blazers. Again, trading Trevor Ariza and a couple of first-round draft picks for Robert Covington. Uh, Covington coming Mm -hmm. off his season in Houston single-handedly was winning them playoff games, both both with his defense and his outside shooting, which is not perfect to be fair. This guy is not like the best on ball defender. He's okay, but not great. He's an excellent team defender and off ball defender. He can get steals. He can get blocks. He can interrupt passing lanes. He can shoot a little bit from deep. I mean, think about maybe Mo Harkless level. He's a career 36% shooter from three. He's been a little bit below that. Uh, last year, I think in the Blazers system in the Blazers have a history of rehabilitating or giving players opportunities to shine, particular if they're, you know, three and D players seems a little reductive for, for Robert Covington. Um, a lot of people really, really liked this signing. I was among those people. When you saw this coming down the pike, I think it was the first move the Blazers made that was announced. What so was kind of your first impression of it when you heard about it? I was ecstatic. I mean, and I, I think most of, you know, most Blazer fans were probably there as well because we've been hearing his name like, oh, if we could get Rocco, you know, Rocco is so great. You know, Covington would make this team so much better. Completely agree with it. I was ecstatic that they were able to pull it off. Um, the fact that it was uh, um, for Trevor Ariza in a pick, which, by the way, has Ariza actually. F- settled on a team yet or is he still being traded he has been bounced around like a four ping times ball. that i know of yeah yeah he is uh he is this year's uh um wade uh wade baldwin yeah i kind of feel but, uh, bad for reza but I mean, he's also made his money and he's at the end of his career but yeah he's been bouncing around exactly but no i was ecstatic for this uh as far as a lot of people are downing on his three-point shooting that he had last year when he was with the Rockets. Um, the case study that I would have to counter that would be uh, look at the player we just finished talking about, Mello, who came off one of his statistically worst seasons of his career, shot the worst he's ever shot in those 10 games with Houston um, from the corner threes, uh, just did not buy into his role. I'm I'm not mad at the fact that he's more of a team defender than a uh, lockdown defender, uh, mostly based off the fact or the uh, the few, or the other signings that we'll talk about, the other acquisitions. Um, the Blazers need better team defenders. Nurk is an amazing team defender. Dame has made strides um, in his defensive game and is more of a team defender. Uh, the fact that you, if you get 
five guys who are team defenders, you don't necessarily need to worry about the fact that you don't have an in- individual lockdown defender because you're not getting guys that are lost in their schemes and lost on switches. Um, maybe we'll finally see a team that isn't going to drop coverage every single freaking time. Um, in this offense, I have full confidence in Covington's ability to hit open threes. I I believe it'll be there for him because at this point in time, we've seen that teams are more than willing to dare anybody other than Dame and CJ to shoot. Well, and really quick on the defense, and you mentioned how the Blazers prefer a drop coverage. Uh, Pardon me if I'm butchering this uh, explanation, but it's when your center and instead of really getting aggressive on the ball handler on screens, they just kind of drop down to protect uh, the middle, right? And like you've seen, if you remember, like the Robin Lopez's and the Mason Plumleys and the Yusuf Nurkic's of the world, mm-hmm. that's the kind of scheme where they thrive. And I think Olshay even said during that press conference that the Blazers may do more switching. I don't know if you'd mentioned that Olshay had said that. And if you did, I, I apologize, I missed it. But uh, I did not. Okay, and and that's something I, I Terry. Stotts as a coach has been criticized for not going into more of those switching schemes. I would argue maybe he didn't have the personnel to do it, and maybe Olshea you can, is, you can argue that, and it is a hundred percent true. You right, are and, only and, and able Ol- to play the players you are given. You don't want Yusuf Nurkic switching onto a point guard, but Robin Robert Covington can do that if you. And again, we are going to get more into minutes breakdowns and rotations, but just the fact the Blazers have a defender who is you know their best wing defender again that they've they've ever had in this era he's a better defender than Aminu he's a better defender than Mo Harkless Wes Matthews when he was you know pre Achilles you know Dame was so young that it was a different team and and so I don't know maybe it's a wash there but um I think easily the best the best wing defender switchable defender the Blazers have had since Dame has matured I think that's without Mm -hmm. question and that's oh yeah yeah it's that's hugely important um, so from one wing to another wing, uh, the Blazers also picked up, uh, Derek Jones Jr. for their mid-level exception, uh, the full MLE, uh, and Robert Covington's making about, about 12 million and change the next two years. Derek Jones Jr. making about 9 million and change the next couple of years. Um, I don't know what your reaction was when the Blazers made that signing. I, again, from most analysts, overwhelmingly positive. Again, I don't mean to keep name dropping Nate Duncan and Danny LaRue, but they were in their mock off season were like very, very high. It's a, they do an exercise where they go through and, and mm-hmm. kind of, you know, place players where they may be placed before the offseason actually happens. Derek Jones Jr. was super, super high on their list. Uh, he's very young, dunk contest champion, not the best shooter, not the best facilitator right he's young he's rise like 22 or 23 initial 23 23 initial thoughts on the blazers adding and you can just call him djj that's completely fine um or dj jazzy jones jr uh or whatever you want to call him what was your initial thought when the blazers made that signing yeah so uh real quick preface on this name thing i am notorious for screwing up at least one blazer player's name and i don't know who is going to get that trophy from me this year between <laughs> uh uh harry harry giles or uh or uh, djj because for some reason i keep wanting to call Derek dennis and i keep wanting to call harry henry well there is a dennis jones jr too right i mean so that's like a player that exists in the nba smith Smith oh, that is from that is, this recent draft class. See, all right, so now I'm doing it. That's, I actually that's the that's the New York kid that went to the Knicks. Thank you. Um, he doesn't play <laughs> for the yes. Blazers, so I don't care about him. Um, exactly, uh, but but I will make that mistake. Um, when they signed him, I said, "Ooh, Blazers Twitter is not going to like this," and I immediately logged on and watched the vitriol. Th- flow because we just went through a moment of which Serge Baca got on a plane and said he was on his way to dot 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 um J- I think that took steam and I even took the bait on this when Jason Quick retweeted it and then somehow uh somebody immediately dug into Abaka's Instagram story and saw a plane with a white plane with a black and red stripe oh for god's thought, sake and thought that the Blazers sent their jet to him. By the way, the Blazers don't own their own private jet. <laughs> and the uh, team plane is not like a plastered Trailblazers plane. So they own their they own their own aircraft, but it is a very nondescript aircraft. So 
you know, we're and this is before this this signing is announced. Everyone's thinking it's a Baca. I personally, I was very high on hoping that the Blazers would sign Crowder or Jay Crowder. Um, so as soon as this was announced, I'm like, this is not going to be good. And immediately you see Twitter going off. What the hell? This isn't going to work. Stotts is stuck in his ways. Um, this guy does like not. Like that signing had a- anything to do with Stotts. I don't know how much. Well, I, I think of all the coaches in the NBA, Stotts probably has on the lower end of pull with Neil Olshay. I, I, well, Stotts does not strike well, me as no, someone but, who's involved in these kinds of things, honestly. Yeah, but that, but, but that was the reason. Is that is that so Neil signed a guy that does not fit into Stott's offense because Derek Jones Jr. is not a guy that you can park in the corner. He's a 27.9 or 28.3 career corner three-point shooter, something along those lines. And he doesn't shoot very many of them. He only puts up a couple of them a game, and I think that's important. Exactly. He's a long, athletic guy who's good at cutting and can jump through the freaking roof, and that's not anything that the Blazers have ran out there. Now, a lot of people come back and counter and they're like, oh, well, because, I mean, just look how Stotts used Mo Harkless. They parked him in the corner a lot. You know, he had athleticism. Derek Jones Jr. athleticism is way more than Mo Harkless. And Mo Harkless's biggest issue was the fact that he didn't care for about 41 of the 82 games. He mentally checked out of games. Derek Jones Jr. is not that type of player. Um, I think it's so. It's also fair that Derek Jones Jr. I mean, again, he's still pretty young. He's a a a quantifiably better defender. I mean, he was a plus defender, even though he hasn't played. I mean, he's been in the league since 2016. He's only played 171 games. Um, he's a good defender, even at his young age, and I think that that's important to note too. Yeah, and there's a great piece about him that the New York Times did. Um, I have zero clue how they came about doing this piece, but they literally had a reporter following him around during free agency. And it talks about the fact that he wants to be the defensive player of the year. And when he was in his conversations with the Blazers, he was talking about the fact that I I feel as though, you know, uh, let's see, let me get the exact quote about his defensive prowess. Uh, He had stated that uh, if I was to come to Portland, I believe that me and Robert Covington uh, could help the team as a or a whole lot. Um, Jones said, adding that he hoped to be named defensive player in the year in the future on defense. I'm going to be guarding the best players. That's what I want. Give me LeBron every night. We haven't had a player come to Portland that's proclaimed those kind of things, nor have we had a player in Portland that could actually legitimately do that. Um, That article also goes on to uh, mention what I had talked about earlier and that the importance of, uh, of family and like the team thinking about players as people because they were asking about his two sons, um, talking about the school system and the area in which he'd be living, helping him find housing and and all these kind of things that other teams don't necessarily do. Now that article did say that um, Derek Jones Jr. was the first call that Portland made for their MLE, but they told him. We're, we have two other players on our list. We're going to call them. We're going to talk to them. First player to accept our offer gets the contract. So, for one, I'd love to know who the other two were. If I had to bet, I'm going to guess maybe Abaka and Crowder. Um, but Derek Jones Jr., he took a call from the uh, Timberwolves and one other team that's escaping me at this time. And he did not like what they had to say about his playing time, his role in the team, his fit. Immediately called back Portland and was like, sign me up. Coming to Portland. Well, and that's, I mean, to hear somebody say that they're that invested in their defense, um, he has the physical tools to back it up. When you look at his advanced stats, it kind of proves that out. And I'm not trying to take too much from like defensive box plus minus, but I'm just saying again, like he played a significant number of minutes in Miami last year. It's a little worrying that he was played right out of the rotation during the playoffs. So, okay, fine. But again, it goes back to the bla- every rotation drops down in the playoffs. I mean, right, the- yeah, he he's probably great in a nine ten man rotation. That's fine. He's got to earn his chops. But uh, I mean, especially with where the Heat were in the or in the finals, you know, you're down to like a six seven man rotation at most. Right, and also, I mean, having depth is huge. 
Uh, I mean, we're going to talk about some of these rotations in the minutes breakdown and how it actually gets a little difficult to split them up and keep everyone happy. But again, he's young. He's really, really athletic. So now you're talking about Robert Covington, Derek Jones Jr. Again, think back to like better versions of Aminu and Harkless, right? I mean, the consistency thing you mentioned earlier with Harkless, the same thing with Aminu. I think that having something that's consistent there, you know that that's going to be there more with Covington than with Jones Jr., but that's going to be huge. Um, That's going to be huge for this team. Uh, Okay, so now we're going to be moving on to, let's see where I am on my list. Uh, The Blazers uh, getting Ennis Cantor. Um, we're kind of going out of chronological order, but that is okay. The Blazers traded Mario Hazonia and uh, slid Ennis Cantor into a trade exception that they had pre-existing. So I'm gonna I'm gonna start here and just say um, having Ennis Cantor back, and this kind of it flows into Hassan Whiteside signing with the Kings and no longer being the backup center is a really big deal. I think this is a big deal, and I was super, super happy to see this. Remember that Ennis Cantor was the starting center for the Blazers just a couple of years ago when they made the Western Conference Finals. He was playing legitimate crunch time minutes down the stretch of that season, deep into the playoffs, uh, right near the end of the Golden State Series when things were getting a little lopsided. He wasn't playing as much. But look, Ennis Cantor was our starting center when the Blazers beat the Thunder. Ennis Cantor was the Blazers' starting center when the Blazers beat the Denver Nuggets in Game 7 in Denver to get to the Western Conference Finals. <laughs> and yeah, there have been all these jokes about Ennis Cantor can't play Cantor because of his defense. Well, look, he performed really, really well in Stotts' scheme. He obviously fit in with this team against someone else who was well-liked by the rest of the team. Maybe he's not the best defender, but you can absolutely rely on him to get rebounds. You can rely on him to get putbacks and to score and to have somebody like Ennis Cantor on this team as a backup, not as your starting center, as a backup, I think that that is huge. So, um, Ryan, your reaction on the Blazers signing Ennis Cantor coming back home to Portland? Well, for one, I really want to know what the phone calls are going to be like between Cantor and Dame after the little <laughs> kerfuffle last year where Cantor played his, you know, Cantor's never met a camera he doesn't like, and where he played his game of that, oh, well, the Blazers pressured me, they wanted me to answer too quickly, and uh, so it's all their fault that I'm not back. And da- er, and then Neil Water under the out. bridge, I think. Neil came out, made a comment. Dame came out and backed up his GM. We'll see how this flies. Uh, I do. I think. I think I, it, I'm not worried about. it. I think it's fine. The the best part of the Cantor signing is the is the fact that we got rid of uh, Mario Hazonia in that deal because yep. I was the saddest I have been in a very long time when I saw that Mario Hazonia picked up his player option. And that very much bummed me out. And so then to read the fact that Cantor, we're bringing Cantor back, somebody who's already familiar in our offense um, or with our offense, and it cost us Mario Hazonia, perfectly fine. Uh, The fact that Cantor chose us over Memphis because he was given the option of you can be traded to Memphis, you can be traded to Portland, and he chose Portland. Yay for us because that maybe is showing some sort of growth in you know how free agents and or other players feel about the team. Um, as far as what his contributions will be for the season, I'm going to put that at very very limited contributions. Really, if if you had to ask me for one, uh, it's come out and been reported that Zach Collins with his injury, he's not going to be back until you know second or third week of January. So at this point in time, that's about like halfway through the season. Um, Zach Collins is a stronger center than a power forward. I would immediately slot him into a backup center role. I do not think that he will jump back into being a starting power forward, especially on this roster. Also, Harry Giles will probably play more minutes than Cantor on this roster. I, we're going to talk about rotation and minutes later. I just want to say really quickly, A, I think Ennis Cantor is meaningfully better than Zach Collins, and B, I think Ennis Cantor is meaningfully better than Harry Giles. Even if the Blazers want to develop Giles, I just, I... 
I disagree with you, sir. Okay, we're gonna- I, have, I have a question. I have a question. Is it Giles or Giles? I don't know. I'm saying Giles. You can say Giles if you want. If you all say right, Giles, right. I'm going to think of Street Fighter, though. <laughs> oh God! I hadn't even made that connection. I think yet. it's I think Jeez. it's Giles, but I, I mean, who All knows? Right. I've been wrong about a lot. Maybe wrong about a lot again. Okay, so oh, Ed, whatever. Ennis Cantor is not your starting center. Okay, he's your backup. No. I think he's a great backup. He sucks up rebounds. He takes up space. He um, he really likes getting rebounds. And you know what? For a backup, I think that's more than enough. And he also well, has you know he can de- score. De- he, he can put up points. Defense yeah. defensively. Here's a scary thought: your second unit is going to consist of Ennis Cantor. And Carmelo Anthony, you're not stopping anybody in in the in the front court there. Well, you know, a game of basketball <laughs> is about outscoring the opponent, and that's really all you have to do. So, and well, if, the Blazers tried that theory last year with their roster, and we saw how well that worked. The, and again, the Blazers have depth. They have depth like you've never seen before. I mean, they really do. When you start taking through this, it's it's a lot of fun. Um, okay, so that's Ennis Cantor. A couple more things. We were talking about Harry Giles or Harry Giles or Guile from Street Fighter. Uh, you know, coming in <laughs> from Sacramento, he was a high draft pick. He was injured. He was one of the most highly touted recruits coming out of high school before he had knee trouble. Um, he <sighs> is he is also still pretty young. You're not relying on him for very much. Uh, I'm trying to quickly scramble and see. He's you know signed for the minimum also um, mm-hmm. for just a couple years. Nothing wrong with that. You know, at a minimum, you have another backup big. At a maximum, you have somebody that again, if he can stay healthy, if he can continue developing, he could be maybe not worthy of a super high top draft pick, but he could maybe thirty percent, twenty five percent chance could be much, much better than his contract would suggest. So do you have any strong feelings one way or the other about Harry Giles? There's a very uh, low-risk, high-reward signing, as as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I am also extremely happy anytime that somebody can actually put their draft cap back on, seeing as (laughs) that the Blazers uh, traded their picks and uh, Giles actually was technically drafted by the Blazers and had to put the Trail Blazers cap on, so it's it's good that he you know, technically found his way back home. Um, I just think that his his offensive potential, you know, there's these injury scares and whatnot. Nobody in Portland likes hearing anything about knee issues, especially when dealing with a center. Um, I think his offensive upside plus his his kind of knack for defense and, and kind of r- patrol in the rim will end up earning him out minutes over Cantor. As the season goes on, I, like I said, I would not be surprised. Cantor will be your your first, you know, your center replacement off the bench day one. But this would not surprise me if Cantor slowly plays his re- way out of a rotation spot for like the umpteenth time in his career. Yeah, that's okay, fine. When you put it like that, that Harry Giles has the potential to play his way into more minutes, I think that's that's fair. Um yeah. yeah. And, and again, like like you just said, he's somebody there was a reason why he was like the most looked at prospect in high school. That mm-hmm. skill doesn't go away. That body doesn't go away. The athleticism definitely could, especially considering his injury history. But again, if he can stay healthy, this could I mean, it could it's probably not going to be a big deal. He's probably not going to factor too heavily into the Blazers plans or rotations. But there is that off chance that he could. Um, that's pretty mm-hmm. cool. So, okay, a, a couple more to hit really quick. Their second round pick, CJ Ellaby. I'll be honest, I don't know. Could not tell you a damn thing about him. I know that he's left handed. I know his he name is to, CJ. He went to Washington. I know that he, um, you know, he's a streaky shooter. He likes to shoot. The highlight reel I saw of him showed him shooting a lot. So. Um, I guess that's something I, I don't, I expect little to nothing from this signing. I don't expect that CJ is going to be, uh, CJ Ellaby is going to be playing any minutes at all this year. Any, no, any no. argument with that? No, zero, zero argument. And, you know, he, as it stands right now, his one, his biggest acclaim to fame in the NBA is that he is literally the only second round draft pick that has been signed to signed to a guaranteed contract. Most of the rest of the league is going down the route of that. They're signing their second round draft picks to, uh, you know, two way contracts. Is there a reason for that? Do you know? I don't know. 
It just depends on cap flexibility. The Blazers had the had the open. I mean, they were sitting at 13 roster spots before signing him. They were well underneath the luxury track luxury tax threshold at the time. Um, signing him to a second round minimum contract uh, only put them, you know, I think like six hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars away from the luxury tax line. Neil has made it known that they don't want to be into the repeater tax because if this roster hits all of these new contracts that they brought in are on one or two year deals you know a couple of them with team options so you know you're looking at the possibility of you know two years down the road if you find yourself somehow magically I'll, i'll buy into your if when the blazers win the championship this year if we are the new warriors for lack of a better term we we've now allowed ourselves the the cap flexibility to be able to re-sign and retain these players without entering into the dreaded thing that the warriors are now facing of this repeater tax right and where you're you know they're paying kelly Oubre like what is it with the tax it's like 60 million dollars a year or <laughs> some insane number like that uh, uh, higher than that. Okay, so yes, the Blazers, like you said, they find themselves about a half million dollars below the tax. And by the way, when you go out to 2023-24, the Blazers are committed already right off the bat to $94 million between Dame, CJ, and Andrew Nicholson's stretched contract. So yes, it, you're right. That I, like, tr- I try not to focus on the Andrew Nicholson thing because I'm. Uh, this is the first year that we no longer have Festus Azili, and I feel as though <laughs> that is a, a reason for us to be Festivus. Uh, for the rest of us. Uh, okay, so CJ Ellaby, not going to be factoring. There's one more transaction that happened that was re-signing Rodney Hood again to a, a two-year deal. I think it was $10 million a year. That second year is non-guaranteed. Rodney Hood was super important to this team. You know, he's coming off an Achilles injury. One of the assumptions that I made in the minutes breakdown that, um, that, we'll, that we'll be talking about is that Rodney Hood, again, coming off that devastating injury, may not be ready to, uh, you know, go step right back into the role he was playing before he went down. But uh, kind of what were your thoughts when they re-signed Rodney Hood? I thought it was a good move. Why wouldn't you do it? Uh, I was happy about it. I knew it was happening all along, and it played out exactly as everybody thought it would. You know, he took a super team-friendly deal last year to try to give the Blazers cap flexibility. Um I saw a lot of hand-wringing on the internet and freaking out as soon as he opted out, but that was we all knew that was going to happen we knew that he was going to turn down his player option because when he spoke to the team last year they it was well reported on that they basically said hey look if you take a little bit of money this year we'll give you we'll we'll pay pay you on the back end and again this goes to prove you know yeah. the overall theme of this is that Thank the you blazers for ha- the blazers have not lied to players they have not pulled pulled you know, the rug out from underneath them and promising them this and then just shoving them out the door. I I think that is actually really organization. Yeah. The organization has kept its word. They did this with Carmelo. Now they've done this with Rodney hood. We've seen it done countless times. This will help in, in numerous ways down the road in different free agency aspects. Um, and it, 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 this uh, bringing back Rodney Hood is a no-brainer. I, I do understand that there's trepidation. He's coming off an Achilles injury. That's a devastating injury for an NBA player. Um, do but every indication is that he is more than on track to be at the same kind of production that he was before. He's at this point in time. Like, even right now today, as we are recording, he is more than a year removed from his surgery. Yeah, but that's a thing. You know, he's 28. You don't know with Achilles. There are so few examples of players coming all the way back from Achilles injuries. I mean, one of the— Wes Matthews. He didn't come all the way back. He came—by the way, he came back much, much stronger than I thought he might, particularly for being maybe a little undersized and reliant on his his, athleticism, but— yeah, his Dallas years were not were not good. His Milwaukee time was good, and it earned him a good contract with the Lakers. So yeah, but, I'm going to count that as coming back. Fine. Okay, so coming back to play meaningful, significant minutes for multiple years after, right? that's, that's fair. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think that there's every indication that Hood could do that. Uh, I do want to just, I want to second your point about 
this says this signing says something about the Blazers' culture that they're trying to foster. You think about Carmelo Anthony coming back. You think about taking care of Rodney Hood. I think Neil Olshay deserves credit for being straight with players and then following through. I do think that matters, especially in a small market like Portland, where you may be not able to get the kinds of players that a bigger market can. You need every possible Mm -hmm. advantage to make your location look as attractive as possible. And I do think that Neil Olshay deserves credit for that. So Neil Olshay deserves credit for that at the same point in time. Uh, the number one player on the Portland Trailblazers deserves credit for being the type of loyal human being. Dame deserves it, credit. That, I, I think Terry that, Stotts deserves some credit. It would not surprise me in any way, shape, or form if, you know, as detail, you know, obviously players know details of what's going on in their locker room. You know, if they're, when you're talking about backroom handshake agreements and all these kind of things and, you know, hey, if you take care of us this year, we'll take care of you next year. You hear about those kind of things all the time in the NBA. Dame strikes me as the type of person and player and teammate in which, you know, day one, he's he's going to Neil's office or, you know, calling Neil on Zoom and being like, hey, so you pro- you promised Hood this last year, so you're following through with that, right? I, and Dame being extremely pissed off if Neil hymns and haws around those. Yeah, and I I do think yeah it's it's Olshay it's obviously Dame I think CJ plays into that a little bit I think Stotts does too all of this I mean I think CJ just bribes everyone with wine that's fair yeah <laughs> yeah his his wine adventures uh, there's a whole other episode to be had about how CJ looked in the in the bubble I thought he looked a little out of shape. Uh, to be frank, um, well, he was he was distraught. They lost eighty bottles of wine. Oh, good lord! Um, but I think I, one thing I have been consistent about in my analysis of Neil Olshay's time in Portland, as much as I've not been a fan, I've been consistent that the organizational continuity from owner to GM to coach to your best players, he has been a part of making sure that that's been super strong. And I think signings like Carmelo Anthony, like taking care of Rodney Hood, I think all kind of plays into that. So I have a, I have a fun thought experiment question real quick. Okay. Just touch on. So, the Blazers with that with all their trades and whatnot, they gave up two first round picks. They gave up this year's, they gave up next year's. Paul Allen is still around. Are those picks being traded? Ooh, that's a great question. I don't know. Are the, move, Paul are the, the same draft. moves still are the still are the same moves still being made because the Blazers are trying to hold on to their draft picks because Paul loved the draft. Paul did love the draft. I I I don't know. I think that's a really good question. And I do think that you may be able to evaluate Olshay differently post Paul Allen because and he said it he does have a little bit more autonomy that Jody Allen Mm -hmm. cares more about being involved with setting the big picture. And then you can find ways to execute that big picture plan where Paul Allen really did like getting into the details. He likes passionate. He was passionate. He was, he was a, he was a fan. He liked his point guards. He, you know, he liked his Nolan Smith's, right? I mean, you can, Armand Johnson, you can tick down the list. So I think that's a really interesting question. He, he did bring us uh, Andre Miller, the greatest point guard of all time. There we go. I will never forget Andre Miller just trucking Blake Griffin after Blake Griffin had been trying to box out Andre Miller in a little dirty way. And then Andre Miller comes down the court and just wipes him out. No foul called. It was the best thing ever. (laughs) That that was fantastic. All right, real quick. I want you to power rank these three things about Andre Miller and then we'll, and then we'll carry on. So power rank the, the absolutely just demolishing Blake Griffin. Okay. The, the fake timeout. Okay. Or in its totality, the 52 points without leaving the ground. Uh, I'm going to throw a fourth one in, which is the dunk. Remember, he had that one dunk that he he flew in for. I, I'm going to put. Oh yes, I do remember that. Yeah, it was. He, it, he he like made a bet with his kid that he could still dunk or something, and then he did it. I it was something. There was some story about that. I'm yeah. going to put the timeout at four, the dunk at three. The you're um, put the fake timeout at four. Well, I just, I'm all about the sparkle and the jazz. You know, I want to see something glitzy and that's like, come on, come on. It's such an Andre Miller move. I'm here for the nuance. I'm here for the chess moves. He was playing 4D chess that night. Fine. 
Um, I, 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 it's tough. The Blake Griffin thing was just so funny. It's so funny. The 52 point game has to be up top, but that Blake Griffin thing, I just, I, everything about that was amazing. Um, okay. So we've, we've ticked through all the moves that the Blazers have made, uh, in its totality, how would you grade this off season? They're done making moves. They're not getting a backup point guard They, you know, Olshay said they're going to run with Anthony Simons. Mm-hmm. So with the well, moves, very, that, very defiantly said, we have a backup point guard. Very defiantly and then, said, and then and then gave his like four second awkward pause just to make sure everyone heard it. And look again, this is he he really wants Simons to develop. I mean that's fine. So between the Blazers adding C.J. Ellaby, Harry Giles, retaining Carmelo Anthony, retaining Gary Trent Jr. Uh, or sorry, retaining Rodney Hood. Getting Ennis Cantor, getting Robert Covington, getting Derek Jones Jr., and abandoning two first round picks, Trevor Ariza, Hassan Whiteside, and Mario Hazonia. Hallelujah. With that in its totality, how would you rate the Blazers offseason? I am lower than the national media. I will give the Blazers a solid B. What is your problem? Explain yourself immediately. I, I disagree been... with you, but I'd love to hear your reasoning and how wrong you are. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wrong. I'm wrong about a lot of things and everything. So, and this, uh, I, I, will, I will be more than happy to add this to the list. I will give them a solid B. A B. A big part of this, and we'll talk about this in your minutes breakdown, is that it has been alluded to that the starting lineup will not include Rodney Hood. That the starting lineup will include. Uh, Derek Jones Jr. and uh, Robert Covington, and I feel that is a detri- that is a massive upgrade on the defensive end, but that puts a lot of pressure back on Dame and CJ, and this reminds me very much of the Mo Harkless and Al Farouk Aminu years in which those guys could not be trusted to score. Um, if Terry Stotts is able to actually adjust his offensive schemes and and be able to set Derek Jones Jr. up for like a back backdoor cutter roll you know he, there's a lot of action off ball that opens him up so his that his athleticism is is on display and can pay off for the team then i will fully eat these words um the canter signing uh well i understand bringing somebody back in that's familiar with the offense um the uh, having you played a well unit. for them in the playoffs, right? Like, by not the just way, did season. you know? Did you know he was fasting? No, <laughs> I actually did, and that makes it all the more impressive as somebody yeah. who has you know done intermittent fasting and has tried yeah. Yeah, to exercise. The amount, of, the, the amount of times that the media let us know that he was fasting, yeah. I will forever just hang my hat on the fact that did you know he was fasting? But him, and I Carmelo did know Anthony, he was fasting. The is, media told that me is, that is going to be a defensive sieve. Um, I, the only other reason that I'm giving this a B is, is going to be because of recency bias in that I gave last year's like an A minus because we that brought was in a markedly worse off season. Exactly. So that, 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 that I, you I'm, just contradicted that doesn't make no, any sense. No, 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 I'm weighing it because I gave last year's an A minus because I thought, so Anthony you want to be wrong Tolliver twice. was going to cut. I thought Anthony Tolliver was going to come in. Sh- hey, I'd rather be wrong on the on uh, on this side than I was last year. So you're saying you're, you're adjusting? Sense. You have to adjust your scale. So this is a post yes scale yes, adjustment. My scale has been adjusted. I have been sold a bill of goods before. I have bought in before. I have been super optimistic before. Wait, really quick. What then? How would you rank last season on this new scale? Uh, what would you have given it on this new scale and not looking backward, but yeah, at the if you, time, if you, if you, if you want the comparisons, how I would rank last season on this new scale, I'd give last season a, uh, a probably a C plus B minus somewhere right in that. I, I think that, that is not enough separation between the two off seasons, given what we knew at the time last year and given what we know at the time. Now, I think that's, I think you're no because there was being a all sorts of the offensive potential of that anth- or of uh, Tolliver coming in being damn near a forty percent three point shooter. We thought Kent Bazemore was going to be was a, a thousand you know, years a old. Creator. It doesn't matter. Let me ask you what this: it, let, you let me, knew let me, he was a thousand years old, but you could look at his statistical production. 
Everybody knew that he was basically a mummy at that point. Okay, like nobody knew. Go back and look at right. the articles that were written last year. Everybody Go back and thought, listen to my podcast. I mean, I, everybody, I, I, everybody I think that we, thought that he, he was going to be a n- absolute knockdown three point shooter. Kent Bazemore was going to be another uh, ball handler and creator and somebody who had a great three point shot. I got that one Mario, wrong. Mario Hazonia was going to be the new Mo Harkless. You know the reclamation project that in Terry Stotts' offense can just blossom and develop. There was so much all more these, there was so much more uncertainty. I know here I'm interrupting because there was so much more uncertainty with those three players in particular. I think that the best case scenarios we were talking about with those three looked pretty rosy. I think the if you're here comparing you go. let me inter- let me introduce the fourth. Let me introduce the fourth. And look at Hassan Whiteside's statistical Look at his box he, score. You know what? Look he actually did okay. Contributions. He did. He did okay. He did okay. Statistically, if you want to do nothing but look at a box score, but if you want to actually watch a game, Hassan Whiteside was fucking horrible for the Trailblazers. He was painful to watch. I think he did okay for what he was asked to do. I'm glad he's no longer on the team. I, I think that with the first three, and by the way, Hassan Whiteside, again, he more or less, Miami fans knew what the Blazers were getting when he came over. And they laughed at us. They laughed but, at us. But he us. was a known entity and he met he met what we knew he would do, I think. He was a, he was a, he was a name brand name. For I'm just saying term. that in my view, what we had coming in last year, you had to put on some awful rose colored glasses and say, they're going to get better. They're going to be, they're going to get better in order to get to a good outcome. I think this off season, the floor is much, much higher. Let me ask you this really quick. So you're giving this yep. off season a B. Oh, go for it. Yep. Okay. No, no, no. Go, you're go you're ahead. giving this off season a B. How dare you? Um, what gives you the right? Um, I want to ask you this. What would you I'm have a fat white guy with a podcast? That's what gives me the right. <laughs> Man, I, you know, being a white guy, with a I podcast, love the Internet. Um, I love the Internet trolls. I, I, I will hang my hat on forever being called a fat white guy with a podcast. I, I actually got I got roasted the other day on Twitter um, and someone made fun of my new politics podcast. And the, the comment was, look at this guy doing a podcast with his brother because he doesn't have any friends. I'm like, how how could you be so accurate and hurt my feelings so badly? <laughs> Hey, you should have just come back, just screenshot the fact that me and you were talking about I'm probably yeah. going to be on there in about two weeks and be like, yeah. bitch, look, one of my friends wants to be here. Exactly. Uh, let me just ask you this, though. You gave him a B for this offseason. Was there anything you would have preferred them to do? Remembering, keep in mind, when we do these hypotheticals, a lot of these signings have to be a two-way street. The trades have to be a two-way street. Whether it's the interest has to come from the player or the interest has to come from the other team. So you can't... Find a way to- find Find a way to placate to Crowder. Get Crowder here instead of letting him go to the Suns. That's my number one thing. If you That's get fair. me Crow- if you get me instead Crowder, of Derek Jones, I'm ge- yeah, I'm giving okay. you an A plus. I don't think that Crowder makes the difference between a B and an A plus. I agree with you that Crowder would have been in better. My book. Okay, that's fair. Um, that's a really good one. I think that's a good answer. Was there anything else that came to mind that you wish they would have done or something that they did do that you wish they hadn't done? Scroll back through the Blazer Tech podcast Twitter timeline and you will see me proclaiming um, an absolute desire for my my personally number one hated player in the league. I wanted the Blazers to bring in Jeff Teague. Interesting. I, w- I was fully on board with the bring in a veteran backup point guard. Stop doing the stagger minutes with Dame and CJ. Take the pressure off Anthony Simons and bring in a veteran PG. Jeff Teague has been the bane of my existence for the past six years. He is a he is one of the noted Blazer killers. I have never cussed at my TV more than when the Blazers have played a team that Jeff Teague is on, regardless if it's the Timberwolves or anybody else. That man carves up this team. I wanted him on this team. I like the strategy of getting better by removing the people who kill you strategy. Yes, th- th- this is no different than I'm like, all right, uh, Jeff Teague's not available. What will it take to get Patrick Patrick Beverly? Like, great. Like, just remove every every thorn in my side and bring them onto my side, and I am perfectly happy. Uh, that is That is my only other nitpick critique. But I do fully understand, as I previously stated, about the team wanting to stay underneath the luxury tax line so they are not a repeater. 
All right, that's that's fair. Uh, I will let you escape with that explanation. Uh, my grade is an A minus. I have to say, my first thought when I look at homer. all these moves in totality, not a homer. So super objective am I. I think that when you look at all of these moves in totality, I'm amazed that the Blazers were able to get this many players, legitimate NBA players who can play legitimate NBA minutes in positions of need. I think that is very difficult to do in the best of circumstances, given that the cap is doing what it's doing and you have the bubble and we have COVID and players are valuing things differently. It's a very difficult offseason to pull off so many different moving parts and to do it in a way that I don't even think like I don't think that this is sacrificing too much of their future either. That's the other thing is I thought to get to this many, again, legitimate NBA depth. I thought maybe you'd have to give up an Anthony Simons or give up a Zach Collins or give up a Gary Trent Jr. They didn't do that. They gave up a first round pick in a draft with a player who's probably not going to help them anyway. And next year's draft, look, that's it. That's a fine price to pay for someone like Robert Covington. The only thing I would have wanted them to do that would have made it an A plus or an A in my book would have been to get a backup point guard. Again, Neil Mm -hmm. was extremely um, under under no circumstance. Austin Rivers. I don't if, know. <laughs> if they would have signed Austin Rivers, I would have went to a bridge, just jumped right the hell off. <laughs> that right into the Austin Rivers. Um, yeah, I, I think that that like I, if the Blazers had signed a backup point guard, it would have been like a straight A or an A plus. I understand that Neil Olshea wants to put a lot of confidence in Anthony Simons, who is extremely young, who came into the league rail thin who was playing pretty big minutes last season, again, with lots and lots of injuries. And if he's playing 20 minutes a game this year, you know something has has gone horribly, horribly wrong. But that's the only thing that I can think of. Yes, maybe there could have been different players they could have pursued. To your point, maybe they could have gotten a Jay Crowder instead of a Derek Jones Jr. Maybe they could have gotten Serge Ibaka to them somehow or maybe lured over someone like Mark Gasol those things fine but again you have to remember that all of this stuff when you're dealing with either players or teams it's a two-way street of interest so we don't know whether Jay Crowder wanted to come here we don't know whether Serge Ibaka wanted to come here we don't know whether Mark Gasol wanted to come here and wait 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 was there talk about Mark Gasol coming here no I'm just saying, like, it, to your point... You're just throwing out names. Uh, yeah, to your to your point yeah. about, you know, someone sure. other than Derek Jones Jr., I was just saying that I get your point about maybe they could have targeted other people. Um, mm-hmm. But here's the thing for me. Uh, leaving aside the backup point guard thing, I think it's fair to say that Anthony Simons, in his age 21 season, someone who, again, played 20 minutes a game last year because of all the injuries, who... It is going to be a good NBA player at some point for some team. I don't mind betting on that. And to me, I have a hard time thinking that Neil Olshay could have done better. And here's the biggest thing. My exclamation point on this offseason. This has meaningfully changed my opinion of Neil Olshay as a general manager, of, as a president of basketball operations. I find wow. myself... Wow. Just I find myself... Chris McGowan. Well, I find myself convinced that the Blazers should not immediately fire Olshay. That's where I was. I was, look, that he's done what he's done. He's done enough. He's had enough time. It's time to get rid of Olshay. I've now been dragged all the way back to, well, you know, I mean, given the organizational continuity stuff I talked about earlier, this was a really good off season. Does, so let me ask you this. You give it a B. I give it an A minus. Does this change your opinion functionally of Neil Olshay at all? Does this move the needle for <laughs> does this move the needle for you on your opinion of Olshay? Absolutely not. I've met the man twice in my life and he's a complete complete and utter ass hat. I'm not saying as a person, I'm saying as a professional. I'm saying as the president no, of basketball no, operations. Okay. No, you don't you don't get to fuck up things numerous times and then do something good once and and call it a wash. What if he okay, let me ask you this. What if between now and the beginning of next year, he puts together another run of like really good moves and he consolidates in the blade? Like, what if he has like another like really good offseason? Like, at some point, it has to start because, because again, I think it, it, I think it gets, I think it gets to the point about Paul Allen about, no longer being here at that point, maybe, right? Like, maybe it gets literally into literally got it's got to balance out. 
Uh, as it stands right now, Neil O'Shea has, in my mind, done four good things and five or er, and like seven bad. And so this offseason bumps him up to a he's done five good things and seven bad. When we get to the seven and seven mark, then we can talk about how I feel about his job performance. And Isn't if that I'm a going delicious, to give him a refreshing grade. drink. A seven and seven. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Well, well I, I'm just a fan of it for the year. 1977 that's fair well i i want to re i want to ask this again here, though here no here's the question i'll post to you if the blazers end up you know granted it's hard to you know just pull win percentages out of your ass when you're thinking about it in the context of a 72 game season as opposed to an 82 game season um if the blazers end up being you know Let's just say the exact same place that they were last year where they're like, you know, eight, nine, ten, that kind of range and fighting for their playoff lives. Who are you going to blame more? Are you going to blame or with how you feel this roster is and what the grade you gave it? Are you going to blame that more on Olshea or are you going to say that Stott need, Stotts needs to go? Because he wow. wasn't able to make this very athletic roster where he has so many different options work. Yeah, so you're saying if the Blazers don't meet expectations, and you're also, I'm assuming... No, no I, I'm just saying the Blazers' bar right now is exactly their performance of last year. If they do exactly what they did last year... But they were horribly injured last year. I don't know if that's fair. Uh, you know, Tory Jones won't, won't agree with this, but... <laughs> shout out to Tory Jones. I, I don't. I don't uh, think. I don't I, think that's a fair comparison I, the because way, of the injuries. By the way, the shout out to Tory Jones. We both love the man. I love just egging him on and and poking the bear. But uh, and, but and no. by the way, I since you brought it up, like I mean, he and I have gotten into some like a Twitter back and forth uh, because of my admiration of Coach Stotts. And I also I'll say on the record, Tory, you clearly know more about basketball than I do, and so I'd probably value your opinion slightly higher than mine. Um, and I appreciate the work you do. So th- that's my comment. I don't think it's fair to compare it to last year because of the injuries i don't think that that's fair at all so what if you looked at the year before no no okay here's the thing there's the injuries okay yeah we'll go uh, no because year before that was a grace of god kind of thing of making it to the western conference finals uh but the, 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 uh, the blazers have been a a p- above 500 team except last year for every single year Stotts has been here except his very first year okay so you're talking about 54 51 44 40 44, 41, 49, 53, and then mm-hmm. 35 wins in a truncated season where they had injuries. I like the if for me, if the Blazers win the equivalent of 50 games, that is completely reasonable to me. If the Blazers win the equivalent of like 53, 54, that's probably getting near the upper range of what you could expect. And if you win the equivalent of like 40, 748 that's probably the bottom of what you could expect before I start worrying. So if the Blazers are like the equivalent of a So a, you have them in this trench cut or you know, shortened season, you have them winning between 42 and 45 games out of a 72 game season. That's that's how the math breaks down. Yes. I actually I, I, I did I, the math I, earlier. I did the, I did the math. I did the math. Sure. So the equivalent of like 50 51ish wins is that what it's that's what we're talking about. I prefer yeah, to talk like about six, it in those terms cuz Yeah, that's like a 60% win percentage. Great. That I think to me is completely reasonable. I think their ceiling's a little higher. Where I'd start worrying is if it's like the equivalent of 47, 48. Again, if the Blazers are only a slightly above 500 team, I can I cannot put the blame on Olshay this not this time they have depth and we're going to talk about their minutes they have depth you said it earlier Stotts does have to be a little more adaptive particularly with his defensive schemes but let's not forget that the Blazers have been a top 10 defense several different times with different defensive personnel granted that was with the drop coverage with like one a, time in Stotts tenure I think one it's time. twice okay well how many years Stotts been a coach but he's not a your- defensive coach and the Blazers, you know, whatever. Okay, so fine. I'm just saying that the potential. There's- God, I have never been more of a Blazers, you know, just absolute shitter than I am right now. You're really starting to stink up the place here, Ryan. Uh, no, I, so I, I would. So to your, your, your question is the Blazers underperform who gets the blame. I think it's got to be Stotts, man. If there aren't major injuries and the Blazers don't do well this year. 
Um, and, and we hate to see injuries. I hate to see Clay Thompson go down for the year. That sucks. But that frankly does give another opening in the West. Uh, the, 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 it is not going to CJ. Houston, he, Houston is is gonna blow it up. I'm hey, calling it now. Houston is a dumpster fire. By the way, I hope to God that Neil O'Shea sent like some sort of like uh, fruit basket to, <laughs> to Houston's new GM. Thank you for like, Robert Covington. <laughs> thank thank you for having your star play. Both of your star players be like, we want the fuck out because your owner decided to you know back the wrong political candidate. <laughs> and and having that become you know hey this known. isn't remember so poly sci wrong so, podcast bro well d- okay come on sometimes sports and politics collide that's and, fair you know anybody anybody who's bitter about that needs to look at politicians throwing out first pitches at baseball games and stop complaining yeah but <laughs> so uh, but, yeah the, know, if they you ever- know that houston went down the shitter and that opened robert covington up for us so yeah by the way, I've seen numerous like, hey, here's how I feel as though the West will pencil out. Everybody who's got Houston at five can just fuck right now. No, hell off. that is so ridiculous. And I want to save that. Um, I do want to go through kind of like where we think the Blazers will land on a different pod. We're currently at an hour 10. Uh, so we're All right, doing. Give me your minute. Give me your minutes breakdown. We're doing go. great. Okay. So, yeah, last thing we wanted to hit was with all of these players, with all of this, what I am calling the deepest Blazers team in Dame's career, period. Which is incorrect. Uh, we can argue about that, but I'm saying it's the deepest team they've had with a bullet. Um, no, give me give me the West Matthews, Batum, L.A., Rocco. What, and and remind me who was on their bench? Rudy Fernandez? Can you name anyone Do else who was on their bench? Not like, he was Sully. He is right up there. There's a Dane jersey right here. There's a Rudy jersey right there. Both of them signed. There's there's a hierarchy in this house, and Rudy Fernandez demands respect. And you had Aaron Aflalo. You had Will Barton when he was five years old. You had Alan Crabb. You had Joel Freeland, Chris Kate. Like, look, Thomas Robinson, this team this year is deeper with more legitimate NBA talent, tested talent that can actually sop up minutes than any team ever. You can disagree with that. That's fine. Whether or not, whether or not their starting five is better. That's a different question. Um, I would probably lean towards the Matthews, Batum, Aldridge, but Dame is a different player. Now he's in a, Dame has mm-hmm. entered a different tier. He's a better player now than he was. So we're not going to talk so about that. Eight years older and he's older, but look, like he's, he's at the older. prime of his career. Now he's, he's a better player. Mm-hmm. So, Minutes breakdown. Here was my stab at it. And and if you wanted to pull up the the graphic I shared on Twitter, you can, or I'm just going to verbalize it because right here. Okay. Right off the bat, we're removing Nasir Little, Jalen Horde and CJ Ellaby. And we're also removing Zach Collins because he's injured. So we're ignoring those four players. Any objection there? Negative Batman. Uh, Okay. Well, the next player we have. (laughs) Okay, so then here's what you oh, have. My, oh, wait, hold on. That was your Christian Bale Batman? I'm trying my best. <laughs> that, that was a little better. That was better. Stop making fun of my Batman voice. Um, that okay. was worse. God damn it. Stop okay, it. Listen, listen, I'm not a voice actor by any stretch. Um, so then you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I have them right. rolling 11 give, deep. So Give me your starting five. Uh, Dame. CJ, Nurk, Covington, and then the twist is I don't think that Rodney Hood is, is going to be ready for big minutes, and you'll see that in my minutes breakdown. So then I have Derek Jones Jr. in the starting lineup. Okay, that is the projected starting lineup that Neil O'Shea has quote-unquote leaked, even though he kept giving the caveat of obviously it's up to Terry Stotts. Obviously, but. I texted Neil directly before that press conference. And I said, hey, Neil. No, just kidding. I mean, it, that, if you got Neil's number, I'm going to need that because I got some questions for him. I'm only <laughs> just I'm just texting him emoji. We're not on talking terms yet. Um, oh, are no, you I just don't sending have him cucumbers and sad faces? And like gifts of puppies and stuff like that. Um, so, so there's a starting five. So then off the bench, you have Cantor, Rodney Hood, Gary Trent Jr., Carmelo, Anthony Simons, and then Harry nah, Giles. Nah. Stopping right there. S- Simons, is, Simons is cut. Simons is break in case of emergency. So let me ask this then, and this is where I was going to go, because I also have Harry Giles as playing spot minutes. So you think that Simons will not be playing regular minutes to start the season? 
Uh, as it stands, and based off Olshay's press conference, he referenced the fact that incorrectly referenced, by the way, but he referenced the fact that Damon CJ spent ninety five percent of the possession or possessions last season, one of them running the point, and Anthony Simons took up the other five percent. Um, I believe that they are with them not signing the backup point guard this year. That we will see m- more of the same with the stagger. Anthony Simon. We're going to see is, the stagger. He's he is getting the short end of the stick on this. It is going to be that Gary Trent is going to immediately come in for or Gary Trent or Rodney Hood is going to immediately come in for CJ. CJ is going to get his rest. CJ is going to come back in for Dame. Dame's going to get his rest. And then we're going to slowly work our way back into the starting lineup. Um, if Ant's minutes are going to be earned in practice, if he is absolutely blowing it out of the water, and it is going to be earned in if we need a completely small ball offense, offensive set to close out a game. Here's here's my thought about this. I, I think what you just said is a completely fair take. Um, how, how many minutes do you have set for Ant? Thank you. Let, let, let me do this. Uh, 14. I know that seems high. Hold on. Oh, here's what my I'm going to do. I know. Here's what I'm going to do. Let me really quickly. Can read. you drop that 10? I could. <laughs> I, it's in an Excel spreadsheet. I'll share it on Twitter. Follow me at Golden PDX. But let me do this. I'm going to tick through the names and I'm going to read the minutes and then we can keep talking. And I want to talk specifically about why I have Anthony Simons that high. Damian Lillard, 36. That's how many minutes he's played forever. It's how many minutes he's going to play. CJ. No, no. Oh. drop that down. Drop. Uh, I, sorry. Look at his history. Through. Like when has he ever played fewer than 36 minutes in the last three, three years, four years? Hasn't happened. By your, by your own words, one of the Blazers had a deeper roster. Very fair. Okay, fine. So maybe you got me there, but let me just tick through them and then we can debate it. Lillard, 36. McCollum, 36. Nurkic, 28. Covington, 28. Derek Jones Jr., 22. Cantor, 18. Hood, 18. Trent, 16. Carmelo, 16. Simons, 14. Giles, 8. That's 11 deep. Those are my minutes breakdowns. Your face is contorting like a puppet on a Sesame Street show. What what about that I, struck I, I, you so strongly? I feel strongly. as though I just walked into my house. Ha- I feel as though, like I, the look on my face and the the guttural reaction that I'm having to those minute that minutes breakdown. I feel as though I just walked into my house and saw my wife like having an affair. It's <laughs> this this how I feel about your minutes breakdown. Your minutes breakdown is horrible. It okay, is horrible. So uh, tell me why it's there, horrible, and there, let's start with Anthony Simons. Maybe zero, you want to start there. There, there is zero reason Anthony Simons is going to get bare minimum minutes. I did, here's these. why I disagree. Olshay said explicitly during the press conference, "Look, is Olshay the coach?" No, but he said explicitly during the press conference, "Look, I didn't sign a backup because we believe in Simons." Olshay believes in his you guys. Mean the future superstar that we were supposed to have a breakout season from last year. That, he's like that same. He's twenty years old. He's real thin. Yeah, but, it's his third but year. Going into la, but going into last season, he was a he was the uh, the best draft pick that Neil and Olsen now he's ever better. Made. And now he and now he's twenty one. And now he is better than he was last year. All right. Ostensibly, I have him playing fourteen minutes, which does seem pretty high. Specific Drop that by ten, and I'll specifically I'll because the Blazers have an interest in developing him. So even though in my minutes breakdown, I do have Damon CJ staggered, but for one two minute slot, which Anthony Simons then fills as a point guard. Other than that, they are staggered. And look, like if Simons. If his development is not a priority for Coach Stotts, then you're right. Those minutes are going to get washed away because he's not the best player. If you were doing a lineup, Ryan, if you were doing a lineup and a minutes breakdown of who the best players are, it wouldn't look like this. Like mm-hmm. A lot of this has to do with development and ego management. So I think that your point is well taken, and 14 for Simons is pretty high, frankly. It is. Yeah, yeah. and and. For me, let's see. You have both Damon and CJ at 34 minutes, correct? 36. That's what you had? 36? All right. Drop drop both of them down to 32. Um, Nurk. No way. Okay. No, 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 no way. He's on. not no, going no, to 32. No. There's no way. 32. And if unless the Blazers, wanna, if, if the Blazers make, are on a 60 wanna, win pace and they're winning games by like 30 points, then maybe. Other than that, no. Not going to happen. Wanna, if you want to make a deep playoff run, you need to keep them capped at 32 minutes we have other, we have the, no historical on. data to suggest that will happen well here's the other thing is that the nba is shoving a 72 game season down our throats in 112 days 
NBA teams will basically be playing every other day. Okay. Even if they're going to go, you know, in like their little bubble format of like the Blazers going down to L.A. and they're going to play like three games against the Lakers and then three games against Clippers. If they're going to keep it with that, the NBA is going to be playing every other day. How dare you make a good point? I'm pointing at my camera. How dare you make it? That's that's actually a really good point. This is a a condensed season. I saw you throw a paper ball there. Where yeah, did it go? It's, so, it's gone. Yeah. So, so, okay. so after after your Dame and CJ uh, having them for massively inflated minutes, I'm going to put them at 32. What did you have for Nurk? 28. That, uh, drop that down to 24 and I'll be happy. And split the remaining backup center minutes before Zach Collins comes back. Split right. them evenly before or er, between uh, Giles and, uh, and Cantor. That's fair. I the, I want to pick at something though. Like um, I think two things. One, Nurkic is as I said that I think Cantor is meaningfully better than both Gile, Giles and Collins. Nurkic is meaningfully better than anyone else they have at center, um, and I think that also Nurkic enjoys playing. And I think twenty eight is not unreasonable. I think he played thirty last year. But the other thing is, I think in your minutes breakdown, he also averaged twenty three minutes in the bubble and was obviously gassed. I, he's coming off coming off an injury. What are you going to do? Like at at this at this very moment, though, he's not participating in basketball activities, and he is over in Bosnia taking care of family issues. So, I'm going to make the same assumption of him coming back from injury as as I will with him coming back into this season. I think ramping up your activity when you're fully healthy is different than when you're ramping up coming off an injury. So maybe you're right, but I want to pick at. You have Harry Giles playing more minutes than I do. I think I have Giles at eight. The only reason, again, I have him even that high is because I think the Blazers have an interest in developing him. Otherwise, I would probably distribute those minutes right over to Cantor and maybe do some power forward shuffling. But you think Giles will be playing more than eight minutes a game? I I think Giles will be playing uh, minimum eight minutes a game. Why do you think that? Why are you Again, the way you be, are? <laughs> uh, I am the way I am because I'm a faulty human being. No, uh, because be, because of uh, Giles, Giles, you know, because of Harry's age. <laughs> and he's 22 um, coming into this season. Exactly. He's young. You, you have the chance to develop a, a backup center at this point in time. And so... As opposed to Cantor, who's stuck in his ways, who's set, who's set in, in what he can offer you, you know exactly what you can get from Cantor. You don't know what you can get from this other player. So let's take this time to develop, see what we have there, see see if he can fit into our mold, and see if we can get him to where we want him to be long term. As of, so right, as you, of right you, now, you, do you think that Giles is better than Cantor as of today right now? Combined skill set, yes. That's so weird. Okay, continue. I don't agree, but yeah. Well, I mean, we're well, we're, so we're known we're known, we're known to, disagree, to disagree, and it makes it more. It makes it. It would be really boring if we were like, "Oh yeah, you're right." <laughs> um, so, well, by the way, that's my same thought. Good job. God. I don't. I don't like that stuff. So you win a minivan. <laughs> uh, sorry, that was. I, well, I was in the announcer voice. I was just going to go there. Hey, you win a new car. So I think Harry Giles is not as good as Cantor as of this moment. I think that. Yeah, they do. They have an imperative to develop him. And I think there's the possibility, as we talked about earlier, Mm -hmm. that Giles could be much, much better than his salary or his previous history would suggest. I think it's worth noting that he was starting for the Kings last year for a number of games. He was there was a stretch there where he was playing the Kings. Yes, I'm just saying Kings. he was playing 20, 25, 30 minutes a game for a short burst. So he's physically able to do it. I'm not aware of him having any injuries as of now. So, hey, I, by the way, guess who just got his minutes? Hassan Whiteside. Oh, man. What are the Kings doing? What are they doing? Um, Buddy Heald must be thrilled. Um, so, I, okay. So you think Harry Giles will play more? Let's talk about someone else, too. I, I want to talk about Carmelo Anthony. Olshay said explicitly during the press conference that Carmelo would play between 20 and 22 minutes a game. He said he's probably not going to start. He said he'll probably have the opportunity to finish games. I think that will be circumstantial based on how well he's playing and based on the lineups. Well, and what you need, offense versus defense. Right. And I think that this one, I have him at 16 minutes. The reason why I I don't necessarily— 
Yeah, I, so I, and I think that that's like, again, you're trying to balance who your best players are with there's an ego management part, there's a development part. You need to keep everybody happy and eating somehow. Again, if you're rolling 11 deep, in your view, we're going to be rolling 10 deep because Simons isn't in the rotation, but it's a tricky no, balancing that, that act. That drops, without Simons, that drops me down to nine. Uh, it's, uh, who's the other one who got dropped then? So I am going with Dame, CJ, DJJ, Rocco and Nurk for your starting five. Okay. Coming off the bench, I'm going Rodney Hood, Carmelo Anthony. Uh, Gary Trent Jr. That is Gary Trent Jr. And Giles. And, and Giles. So you don't have that, Cantor that, in there. That's the that's probably the biggest. Uh, well, again, it's the I I believe long term over the course of the season, Giles will get more minutes than Cantor, but there will be some intermittent splits between the two of them. That's fair. And the other thing that's hard about this is like, you're trying to create a minutes breakdown that's going to change from game to game. It's going to depend on who you're playing, how the players are doing, how close the game is or isn't. And so we're doing our best with this, right? But so I think mm-hmm. one of our biggest fundamental disagreements is how much Cantor is going to be playing. But with Carmelo, again, you need to play him somewhere in the ballpark of 20. I have him at 16. Um, I Here's what I want to talk about next. This one is the one that that is giving me the most pause. And I'm the one that put this together. I have Gary Trent Jr. only playing 16 minutes a game. He was playing like 30 plus minutes a game Absol- last year. So you think that's off? It 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 uh, it depends on how he comes out. I feel as though with his production as a last season, with uh, how the team has talked about him and his off season workouts, um, things that I've heard behind the scenes about the stuff he's focused on um, from a couple of different uh, you know scouts slash agents. Because yes, I actually do have connections. I do know people. Okay, <laughs> um, soft he's, flex. <laughs> soft. Well, I mean, it's uh, no no more of a flex than your uh, Peloton back there. Oh, for God's sake. You just had to say it. You know, Cassie got the health care, health workers discount on that. And yeah, uh, yeah. well, now you can't edit it out. So, haha, ha, motherfucker. Well, you know, I did a 45 minute power zone ride with Dennis today that was like an 80s bop. And boy, we were in zone six for two minutes at a time. It was tough, man. It was tough. I was sweating. All my power zone riders, I shout I out. I know you didn't understand a word of that. That's fine. I, I don't know if that was English or not. I just work <laughs> in a construction job and actually do manly things every day. So that's uh, anyways. Um, my delicate, delicate hands. What what point was I trying to make? Damn I don't it, know, man. I think we were talking about Gary Trent Jr. Yes. Uh, you just had to Gary, make fun of my Peloton. <laughs> I did. I did. I had to find a way to bring that in. Um, but no, Gary Trent, he's... This he's going to get a good solid run at the beginning of the year. He's going to get a good, you know, 10 to 12 game stretch to prove himself with everything that he's been trying to do in his offseason, what the team's been trying to shove down our throat in social media of how he's been working on his game and how he's been trying to improve. And if he doesn't, he's going to get the short leash. Yeah, I. I had the most trouble with this one and here in its totality, again, if you're assuming Simons is getting minutes, which he may not, if you're assuming that Rodney hood is not going to be fully ready well, yet. And cause I only have hood at 18 minutes, right? Like, ha- have you heard the, uh, the certain loss or roster lineups that people have put out there that have Gary Trent jr. Starting that their starting five is Dame, CJ, Gary Trent, Rocco and Nurk. So, because that is a very popular belief. I think that's possible. I think that's super interesting. It's very unstatian, but it's very much like we're talking about Olshay, talk about switchability, flexibility, mm-hmm. kind of the new NBA. I think that is possible. I would actually, I'll be honest, like I hadn't thought about that. But that would be a lot of fun, and if it worked, it would be really fun. I mean, that strikes me as a closing lineup right there. Yeah, and that, if, yeah. If if you know, like, if you're like down, you know, two to three points, and you need a bucket, you're probably gonna, you know, completely spread it out and put, uh, you know, mellow in as your as your quote unquote five, but. Well, let me, because we are at, I mean, we're at an hour 30 now and and shout out to everyone who's still listening. So I want to, I want to kind of put a bow on this. You invited the guy on who's the big fan of the long podcast. Oh, I mean, I, Rip City Report. I, you know what? Here we go. As a tribute to the Rip City Report, I feel as though we need to go 142-16. 
I don't know if we're doing 12 more minutes, but uh, you never know. Um, I could have like 10 minutes of silence in there. I wanted to put a bow on this by asking this. We ticked through a bunch of different players' minutes. Uh, mm-hmm. Two more I want to ask really quick, just up or down, where I have Covington at 28. How do you feel about that? But that that seems right. And then I have Derek Jones Jr. at 22. How do you feel about that? Massively. Eh, well, not massively. Uh, I'd probably drop that down to 16 to 18. All right. Well, I would say if anyone wants to, um, I, maybe I can share this Excel spreadsheet as a Google Doc because it also has a portion of it over to the side that shows when certain players play during the game. Um, it's super interesting because, again, once you start shuffling those minutes around, it gets really tough. Like who plays what position? You're running out of minutes over here. You need more over here. Um, we talked a little, about, but a little bit about the starting lineup, but let's ask really quick. Actually, let's quickly sneak in a question from Triple Dog yeah. at Eric J. Also, oh, you're, you're reading that. Uh, there's another question that needs to be answered as well, but we can start with Triple Dog. Good. Oh, who I- has actually co-hosted on my Blazer Tech podcast before? Oh, dope. Shout out to, to Triple Dog. Um, so I think. the question is, Neil O'Shea thinks that Derek Jones Jr. and Robert Covington will start, but knowing Stotts and his propensity to tinker, what's your over-under on how many unique lineups we will see from the start Ooh. until about mid-February? Also, isn't Witty just your co-host at this point? To the second point, it kind of feels that way, doesn't it? Um, it does. We'll here. come back to that question. There's another question that deals with this as well. Very well. <laughs> but what do you think about like how many unique lineups might we see between now and mid-February? God, I- this this is a roster that gives Stotts the ultimate crazy option. So, like, I mean. We're talking at this point about 14 human beings and what is the most amount of varying matchups that we can have with these 14 human beings. I feel as though we need to like invite Neil deGrasse Tyson on here to get like the, the mathematician physicist oh, yeah. thing. Astrophysicist. Well, okay, let's start here. I, I, so we, we started with a Dame CJ Nurkic Covington Jones Jr. That's lineup number one. Mm-hmm. Put in Gary Trent Jr. That's a different lineup. Maybe Carmelo uh, Stiding. Ha- having no... Mello will not start. I guarantee you, outside of massive injury issues this year, we will not see Mello starting. The only other option that I would throw out there for a starting lineup would be uh, would be Hood. Uh, I do not believe that when Zach Collins is fully healthy that he will start. God, so, all right. How many You're going with three. To start. I'm yeah, going to go with yeah, four. I'm, I'm going to go with four. I got, I got I, three. I think so my- I, guess, I guess basically then... Uh, it, how I read this question, he's asking us to set the over under. Then we got to go three and a half because you're taking the over and I'm taking the under. Yep, exactly. Good. Yep, that's exactly right. So, um, yeah, I, I think Mellow starting is in in the stars. I, I see that. Like, it, it, I do agree that like Stotts does like to play around with stuff, and I just I wouldn't be surprised if only if only to give a signal to Carmelo that he is wanted and valued, and mm-hmm. if it doesn't hurt them too much. Right. Like it's not like, again, if, as long as he's not taking a thousand shots and playing 30 minutes, I think that's totally fine. You said that you had another yeah. question, though. Yeah. Do, yeah. Do you have it handy? Because so, I, don't, uh, I don't see it. Uh, let me let me just scroll through these uh, Twitter mentions here real quick. Um, so you posted the question. Um, one at witty ryan which by the For way God solid sake. twitter solid twitter handle that uh, i mean I that, that individual this was what this was <laughs> deserves an award um but at this point at four or five appearances uh i'm basically your co-host right oh wait that's me that's asking that i mean <laughs> you've had me on constantly bro are we just gonna pull the trigger i mean get down on a knee man it does feel like you know two people who are dating but like one of them doesn't really want to commit or yeah i mean you're definitely like the vip guest there's no doubt about it um i will have my agent get back to you on that we got to do some contract negotiations there's some intellectual rights stuff we have to work through there's some egg timers we have to put on and make sure that we're hitting our marks but uh yeah i mean i I, like no bullshit i always appreciate you and i appreciate you taking the time because it is fun oh i Um, i love you i love you too bro (laughs) hey good conversation even if you have two people who are really good at podcasting sometimes the conversation just doesn't really work and i think it works with us um so let me ask this then we're, we've talked starting lines we've talked minutes last thing before we bounce uh 
What do you think about their closing lineups? I know that closing lineups are highly dependent on who you're playing. They can also be dependent on how well your players are playing at any given time. Um, heck, they can be even be dependent on, you know, uh, trying to kind of outplay the other coach, right? Like, even if you have a similar lineup that you're facing, and even if players are playing about as well as they could play, you could have something mixed up just to try to get an advantage. So I have my closing lineup, uh, at least in this chart, as Dame, CJ, Nurk, Covington, and Mello. I even feel a little queasy about that. I'm not sure Mello is the best person to be closing games. Part of the reason why I wanted to put that in there was, again, as a signal to Carmelo Anthony that he's wanted and appreciated. We've heard Neil O'Shea already say during his press conference, and not that, look, not everything that Neil O'Shea says during a press conference is gospel, right? or will be adhered to strictly throughout the season. But I think the fact that he mentioned Carmelo Anthony being in the closing lineup, that's something that's an important cue to take. So let me ask you this again, closing lineup. My first blush at it was again, Lillard, CJ, Nurk, Covington, and Mello. How do you feel about that? And with the caveat that closing lineups are going to change a ton, how many different mm-hmm. permutations do you think we see? Again, assuming health, and in this one, we're assuming that Collins is not yet available, but how does that feel? How does that sit with you? Mm, but that sounds about right. I mean, like, Nurk is a... Nurk is both a plus on defense and offense, and so, uh, barring foul trouble, like, if you absolutely cannot, you know, sacrifice a foul via Nurk... Um, he will be in most of the closing lineups, uh, unless the team absolutely needs a three. And then that previous small ball lineup that I spoke about, um, would come into play. The other one I, I, the other one I thought about was Gary Trent Jr. Being in there kind of the same way as we were talking about a a starting lineup. I think that like, if you're closing a game with Dean, CJ Covington, Gary Trent and Nurkic, that mm -hmm. that's interesting to me. Maybe you slide in Derek well, Jones Jr. I mean, in there. I don't know. Well, well uh, Rocco, uh, through his time in Houston, he he had played spot minutes, closing lineup-wise, as playing their five. Which we, you would if not he, see here because Nurkic is definitely going to be doing that. Like I, Well, it depends. Do you need a three? Do you yeah, need a, well, do you, do you need I'm not a, saying like you, closing are you, play. Are you, out of, are you out of timeouts? And do you need a defensive stop and a quick three? That's okay. So I want to differentiate between a closing lineup and like a crunch time, you know, rotation that you have for the last couple. But I mean, I'm talking like the last four minutes of a close game. What's generally going to be happening? Your point is well taken. You're right. Like last couple possessions, you're going to see even weirder stuff. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I'm I'm talking more kind of like the four minute kind of last four minutes of the game type of thing, which I oh, do. So, so basically like your NFL version of the last two minutes. Yeah, basically. Last two minute drill. All right. Uh, the number one lineup you will probably see with this roster will be Dame, CJ, Gary Trent Jr., Carmelo Anthony, and, and Nurk. Not Covington. Not Covington. I don't agree. I think that you need Covington's <laughs> defense. I mean, Gary Trent Jr. is an okay defender, but Covington's if, bigger. If... if I guarantee you that because Stotts is an offensive coach, if you are in a tight game, you know, three points either ahead or behind, that Stotts will go full offense. He he will bank on the fact that he feels his team can outscore the other team no matter what. All right. I think that's fair. Um, I think we've squeezed about as much juice from this orange as we can. Ryan, was there anything else having to do with the off season or kind of these lineups that you wanted to hit on before we announce? Yeah, we're, we're a week away from training camp starting and, uh, I will probably reach out to you to have you on my podcast here in a short little bit, but I want on the record on your podcast, I'm going to need your blazers, uh, win total. Give it, give me their season stats. Okay, this is frustrating because I had it, and again, you have to prorate it because of the shortened season. Um, no, so- no, no, no. I, I so out of a seventy-two game season. So right now, Bet Online AG has the Blazers at forty and a half wins, which portrays out to a forty-six win season for the Blazers in a regular eighty-two game season. I want their win win number, loss number. Give me that. 
Uh, I can. Uh, I have it. I don't want to say. There it is. Got it. My projection is that they win 45 games. That's my projection. 45 uh, that, games? That would be a 51 win equivalent. So okay. the, the over under set at 39 by. Did you just say that? Sorry. Um, their over under set at 39 by sports betting. Milwaukee has the highest at 51. No. Cleveland so, has so the lowest did, at 21 and a half. You did sports bet. I did bet online. Fair so enough. But bet, okay. bet online has you know uh, forty and a half. Uh, uh, for our local listeners, uh, uh, Oregon Lottery scoreboard they have them at forty one wins. So but wait, I want to over under. I want to make a point about that. When you're using the like, they are trying to get action on both sides. So like, when I say mm-hmm. I think they're going to get forty five, I'm not trying to make money off it. That's just what I think that they're going to get. I think that's By the way, a, I bet I'm trying to make money off of it. Okay, well, that's <laughs> that's fair. What do you think? What, so my prediction is 45 wins, which, again, would be a 51-win equivalent. What's your, mm. what's your, uh, what's your stat at it? Uh, real quick, with that, with that win percentage, uh, what place are you giving to them in the West? Oh, boy. I hadn't thought about this as much. I am going to go with... Oh, I want to be an optimist. Um, you really want to say two, but you don't want to. You don't want to shoehorn yourself into that, do you? Third, I think they're going to get third. Them. Yeah. All right, great. I I align with you in that they're going to be third. Uh, I believe that the Nuggets did did take a step back, but I believe the Clippers took numerous steps back, and I believe that the it will be Lakers, Nuggets, Blazers. That that's my top three right there. Uh, Houston can piss right the hell off. Golden State will probably end up somewhere around like six or seven. Phoenix will probably end up overtaking a four or five spot. You know, we'll just shake everything out after that. Uh, Dallas Mavericks mm, probably going to be battling Houston for that four or five spot. Uh, I will put the Blazers in this season. I will give them forty four wins. Okay, forty, and I said forty five. Yep. Yes. The the very weird thing that we have yet to hear any national media talk about, you know, especially in regards to the Trailblazers, is they always talk about like, oh, if healthy, barring injury, all that stuff. The important thing to look at this year is that the NBA is not playing in a bubble. The NBA is going to be traveling. The NBA is going to be moving around. We are not isolated as we were in the playoffs and the play in tournaments. And we've seen this in other sports, college football. I'm, I'm kicking that, you know, sample size out because college kids will be college kids. will go to frat parties, NFL players. They've been mostly disciplined. There's, but there's still been breakouts, uh, major league baseball players there. There were breakouts during their season, even though they were pretty much disciplined. The NBA is going to be interesting because you only have a 14 or a 13 to 15 man roster. And so if you have an outbreak of COVID, how many, if, you know, even if the CDC does drop down their, you know, quarantine period, as with this truncated season, you know, you're going to be playing a game every other day. So if you say Dame comes down with COVID and has quarantined for 10 days, you just lost him for five games. And how well do you think this team is going to do if you lose Dame for five games? This isn't. Well, it's funny that, that you I'm, say that. <laughs> this isn't a season that I'm looking. Oh, oh my God. If you give me breaking news, I will. throw. No, 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 computer. no. I just I did. <sighs> I did a breakdown of what the minutes would look like if Dame gets injured, which is where their depth really helps a lot. CJ playing a lot of point guard. Simons's minutes bump up. Gary mm-hmm. Trent's minutes. But like they can absorb a short term absence even from their best player enough mm-hmm. to tread water or maybe even a little but, bit better. So, but, but, but here's the thing with the NBA and COVID say Dame gets COVID. He goes to some Adidas party, launches a new shoe, whatever he gets COVID, but he was on the court with CJ. Like the Blazers are running four people out there in a practice facility at a time. He's on the court with CJ. He's on the court with, you know, Gary Trent, he's on the court with this uh, this other guy. You know, you've now killed a quarter of the roster by one guy coming down with the 
the virus. I think that's a fair point, and we're going to see Corona. that happen. We're going to see yeah, that Corona. happen with some teams, right? And like, I also think that there's the outside possibility of the season being in jeopardy if there's an NBA player who gets COVID and they become seriously ill. I would not be surprised if the NBA pivoted how they were approaching the season based on something like that. I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so, okay. So we both have a relatively optimistic view of the Blazers at this point. You gave their off season a B. I gave it an A minus. You think they're going to win 44 games. I say 45. Those are both just around 50 wins. We think Olshay did a good job. I think it helps kind of my view of him a little bit. You don't think so as much. There's going to be a lot more to talk about in the coming days and weeks. I'm excited for the season to be back. I'm excited to be back behind the podcast talking Blazers with you, my friend Ryan. Uh, but that's all we got for today. So with that, can allegedly, you please... Allegedly, you know, a co-host. Allegedly. It's up in the ether. <laughs> An interim co-host, Ryan Whitledge, where can people find your other really good work and where could they interact with you online? Well, I have nowhere for them to find my really good work, but uh, they can find About the their screaming mediocre work. <laughs> they can find the screamings of a madman at the witty Ryan, that, which I will admit that is where you will find more of my real world political beliefs and views. Um, if you want to go straight for my sports opinions, uh, we back every single major sporting event. Uh, we were totally on the side of uh, all the losing teams and most of the major sporting events over this last summer, but uh, at Blazer Tag PDX on Twitter. You can find us screaming into the ether about sports there. Uh, other than that, you know, I just bounce around podcasts. I'm a podcast whore. Nothing wrong with that. Well, man, thanks. Appreciate you. All right. Thank you, Brandon. Love chatting with you. Thank you again to my guest, Ryan Whitledge, and wanted to put another plug again for my new podcast, Remember Poli Sci. It's a politics, a politics podcast I'm doing with my brother. And look, if you're the kind of person who is not following political stuff super closely and it's frustrating and, and boring or you just don't like it, like this might be a podcast for you because honestly, he and I have a really good time. We laugh about stuff. We make fun of each other and we try to just kind of talk about stuff that's happening, connect it to big themes and have a good time with it and so yeah it's like a politics adjacent podcast what i like to call it it's at remember that's remember p-o-l-i-s-c-i.com or search for remember poli in itunes uh, uh google play uh, stitcher spotify whatever um and same thing for this podcast you can find this podcast at i like the blazers.com and i like the blazers on twitter and again it's on all those different feeds i appreciate all of you so much i'm super super excited for blazers basketball to be back so keep it here check out our stuff as we are actually maybe going to be putting this one on youtube and maybe you're watching on youtube if i'm able to get the video editing to work but at any rate i appreciate all of you very much thank you have a great one happy thanksgiving and go blazers Thank you.